Thanks, Shannon. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan Jacobs, and I'm the webinar coordinator here at Data Blueprint. We are so excited that you all found the time to join us for today's webinar on Get the Most Out of Your Data Tools, Data Management Technologies. As always, a big thank you goes out to Shannon Kemp and Dataversity for hosting us. Uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes after I introduce your speaker and also let you know about some housekeeping items. Um, we are planning one hour for the presentation, followed by a 30-minute Q&A session. Um, as Shannon already mentioned, due to the large number of participants, we have everyone on mute, but we will be collecting questions via the public chat. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as time allows at the end, but feel free to submit them as they come up throughout the session. All right, to answer the top two of your most commonly asked questions, yes, you will receive an email with links to download today's materials and any other information you request during the session within the next two business days. Um, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. We have set up the hashtag DataEd on Twitter. So if you're logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets and submit your questions and comments that way. Uh, we will keep an eye on the Twitter feed and we'll include answers to these questions in our Q&A towards the end as well. Um, we also want to let you know about a brand new LinkedIn group, uh, Data Management and Business Intelligence. It is a great place to keep up with industry news, connect with other data management professionals, and gain access to educational resources. Now let me introduce you to our speaker. Uh, Dr. Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized thought leader in the data management field. Many of you already know him and have seen him at conferences nationally and worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions. Um, he is the founding director of Data Blueprint. Peter has written seven books and dozens of articles. He has experience with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as one of the top 10 data management experts in the world. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with organizations as, diver as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. He is highly desired at conferences and workshops and always traveling to numerous speaking engagements and projects. Last week he was in London. Peter, where are you today? So we're on our way back home. I'm in Baltimore today, uh, Megan. And uh, also Shannon, like I said, everybody was uh, here at the conference asking about you. So I'm at the uh, first data modeling conference dedicated exclusively to data modeling called the Data Modeling Zone. Uh, very exciting down here in the harbor front at Baltimore. It uh, actually the, the Folks who were coming in from the UK claimed we had brought the weather with them, but we didn't. It's kind of drab and cloudy, but y'all don't care about that. Let's dive in and talk about data management technologies here today. So uh, as always, this is brought to you by Data Blueprint, and we are owned partly by Virginia Commonwealth University, the largest university in Virginia. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, are proud to uh, help us out with this particular uh, series of uh, educational offerings here. Um, we're going to talk today, as always, with our data management overview, and then I'm going to give you an overview of the tools in here. And we'll start to look specifically at some architectural issues around that. And that will almost inevitably lead us to what most people consider to be the primary tool for data management, and those are what we call case tools. Now, case stands for either computer-aided software or systems engineering, depending on who you're talking to. And it presents us with an interesting dichotomy here. We'll get to that in uh, just about 20 minutes or so as we move forward uh, on this. But uh, then we'll look at this other thing that comes up often, which is called repositories. And uh, we'll talk about that as well. We'll look at uh, some profiling and data discovery tool. We'll talk a little bit about data quality engineering. Again, these are high levels because we're only going to spend an hour on it here. And how that fits into the data life cycle uh, in here. A little bit of repetition from the data quality talk we did a couple weeks back in here. We'll look at some other esoteric technologies in here and then finish up with our Q&A. So let's get started here. Uh, again, our focus always in this is that we really want you all to become more expert in the things you're already practicing, which is managing data as an asset for organizations. The key to this here is that we have now put together a body of knowledge, and we have about 1,000 people worldwide that have passed the designation CDMP, Certified Data Management Professional. They do that by understanding this 
wheel that I'm showing here on the screen. And the wheel is, in fact, our guide to what we start. Uh, so we start off in January with data governance in the center of the circle, and then move our way up to 12 o'clock data architecture management and go counterclockwise, excuse me, clockwise around the circle there. Uh, we finished up with data quality management last month. We have a couple of things we could either take the time off or we could provide you guys some additional uh, focus areas here. And we're going to do these two. The first one here is on data management tools and technologies. And the second one we'll do in December is talking about how to uh, monetize these concepts in here. Uh, as always, whoops, sorry, our um, guide to knowledge is not stri strictly understood as a technical discipline, but it is a socio-technical discipline. We want to make sure that you all understand that we understand that we have to pull all of these pieces together in order to make this work properly. So we need to make sure that what we do fits in with the organizational goals and objectives. As I mentioned before, the certificate in uh, data management here, uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, the uh, entire Data Blueprint staff of uh, consultants have passed this particular designation. There's more on these slides that you can get to. And in fact, they've made that little piece there a hot link uh, so that you can go directly to it. But if you just look up CDMP and DEMA, you will start to find out some more information on this. Or just give us a call or, or ask us about it when we get to the Q&A section in here. See, the real problem is that most people don't understand what it is, what data management is. And so we give them this kind of diagram, which is usually sort of a, a, a mind-numbing thing. So we'll give you the, the management version of it here. And that really says that data management is broken up into five functions. The first one is called data program coordination. And this is the idea that you need to be able to manage your data coherently because if people are managing it for different objectives, then you don't get the advantage of the leverage that we'd really like to achieve as we do this. Second function then is organizational data integration, and this is the idea that we need to share data across boundaries. However, you're probably doing this already in your organization in an uncontrolled and unmanaged fashion. Uh, so whether it's program to program data sharing, whether it's part of the organization, for example, the marketing department with the production department, uh, sharing data back and forth that way, or whether it's between your organization and a, uh, a business partner organization. All of these things mean the data is moving back and forth, and we need to be able to control it just the same way as if we were moving money back and forth across our organization. Similarly with money, too, we know that the CFO of most organizations, the chief financial officer, is responsible for what happens to the money in the organization. We are now going to talk about assigning responsibilities for the data. This is our concept that we call data stewardship here. And then building new data systems is the idea behind data development. And in the past, this has meant databases. But we now know with virtualization, XML, and portals, we can start to do this in some new and innovative ways, and quite frankly, many of the ways that are simply not taught in traditional college and university programs. I say that with full knowledge that you all know that I am a college and university professor. And finally, the last category in data management is data support operations. This is making sure that data is available, whether it's through a hurricane, as we all suffered last week, or uh, whether it is through some other type of uh, catastrophe that we have. It's business continuity, backup, and recovery, and tuning and operations, because these are big, complicated technologies. And we simply can't put them in place and expect them to run on their own. They do need specialists uh, in order to do this. So that's what we mean by data management overall. Let's dive into the presentation now. Data management tools overview. The real key for this, again, I've used the word leverage already. Leverage is a critical component. If we have financial assets, we may leverage those financial assets by, for example, borrowing and using some of our money and some borrowed money on a business venture. Well, data is all about leverage. And the idea is we have to be able to take data, a small amount of data and a small amount of dedicated professionals servicing the data, and make sure that applies to the various organizational uh, requirements that we're doing. If we don't do that, somebody might ask the question, why? So our basic thrust of this is that data are assets, same as financial human capital, perhaps real estate, et cetera, et cetera, types of assets in here. And if we are going to succeed at this, we have to understand the way in which these tools and techniques allow us to gain leverage with our organizational data. There's an old saying, a tool in the hands of a fool 
and of course you guys can fill in the rest of that. So it's very, very critical that people understand how to use these tools, that they are available, and that they can be applied with the proper architecture and engineering discipline in order to produce tangible results for our organizations that we work with. Most organizational environments end up looking something like this, and I'm just putting this up as a mishmash here. Um, frankly, this was one that we did in an afternoon at one company. It was in St. Louis, in fact, uh, to, to pull it together. These are all the various types of things that they had in their environment. And of course, what they wanted to do was have them all connected. Actually, this slide was made way back in the uh, 80s, believe it or not, and uh, it looks like a cloud computing slide now, doesn't it? An advertisement for that. The, the real key for this, though, is that we have to understand organizationally, we must be able to do the type of engineering that is required to solve the problems that our organizations are facing. And if you look on the right-hand side of this diagram, you'll see this thing labeled as is data implementation. Well, that's a nice thing. That's what you have in your organizations at the moment. And if we are going to move that data from one place to another, whether we are taking it from a transactional system and moving it into a data warehousing system, or whether we are uh, uh, building new systems, hosting new systems, putting in an ERP, or moving it to the cloud, if that's what we're trying to do. The worst thing, the worst thing that you can do is to move the, direct, the data directly from the as-is data implementation to the to-be data implementation via forklift. That's usually the word that people use for it. So and I'm going from the upper right-hand corner to the lower right-hand corner on this six-quadrant diagram. In order to do data properly, you must re-engineer it. And re-engineering follows the process of starting in the upper right-hand quadrant, the as-is data implementation assets, and reverse engineering it back into our as-is data design assets. And the reason is because it is not just likely, but it's probable that your data in the new system does not match the structure of the data in the old system. So we need to transform those as-is data design assets into to-be design assets. That's moving now from the top to the bottom of the diagram. Then we move them to the to-be data implementation assets. If we are changing the requirements, that only works if we're doing just the design and we're not changing the requirements. If we're doing the requirements, we actually have to go to as-is data implementation assets, as-is design assets, and then back to the as-is information requirements. We obtain all that information by reverse engineering the data. And then we move from the existing system to the new system, which comes down now to the 2B requirements assets that then gets a 2B design assets and then the 2B data implementation assets. Again, our, our point here is simply that we've got to be able to understand this process. If we don't understand the existing data, then we don't understand its strengths and weaknesses, its capabilities and its limitations. If we don't understand any of those, it's highly unlikely that we will use and build on the strengths of that data and we will eliminate the weaknesses in that data. So re-engineering is a technical term that says you must first reverse engineer your existing systems and then use that information by incorporating it into the design of your new data assets. If that's unclear in any way, shape, or form, get, us, get back to us at the questions and we'll, we'll try to walk through it in a bit more detail. But this re-engineering of data is so much more important in the data world than it is in many of the other worlds that we deal with. And in order to be able to move from your physical as is to your to be, it is absolutely critical that you understand what's going on. The process of doing that is reverse engineering, then using that information in to inform the design of the new system, and that is the process of re-engineering your data. If we don't have that type of a process, then we can never achieve these kinds of results. And let me just explain a little bit about this diagram here so that you understand it. If you're working with a new system, and this is an ERP system of one sort or another uh, that we picked up on one of the projects, and we're trying to figure out which pieces go where and what things go to what other things, we are able to actually query the existing system, the ERP, 
and ask it to provide us with some metadata. Well, this metadata is what you have in front of you on this slide. And you can see that the home page is labeled benefits. It goes down beyond row 34, so you can't see any more of it. But that in this benefits home page, there are at least two business processes that are existent. First one is called administer based benefits. I've highlighted it in pink. And the second one is called administer based billing, excuse me, benefits billing, and that's underneath the pink. Each business process has one or more components. And you can see there are four of them associated with administer based benefits manage benefit enrollments US, manage dependent benefits, manage leave accruals, and report benefit participation. And each of those has one or more steps in it. Now, what I'm doing is illustrating to you some of the factual information about systems that you need to have because if you take the data out of context and try to figure it out without understanding which business practices it's associated with, it just becomes ones and zeros and becomes an absolute mush, which is why some of these things end up being such challenged projects uh, all the way around. Now, again, Managing data should follow the same principles and standards that any technology does. And the leading focus in this area is ITEL. So we've given you a link there to the ITEL website. Uh, many of you have heard about it. If you need to, to understand more about it, again, give us a shout. We'll be glad to, to talk about that at the end of the presentation. Now, when you get into the various data management technologies, it becomes incumbent on us as practitioners to understand how it works to understand what the value is that it provides, and to understand the requirements that we are asking a data solution to provide before we step into the technology and dive into it. If we don't have these things well understood, we will not be able to use these tools technology, technologically correct. <clears throat> Again, the questions that you should be able to answer as you're looking at a specific technology is what's the problem it's trying to solve? Why is this technology different from the others? Are there things about it that are separate from the others uh, that are distinct from the others? Are there specific, again, you can see we have a list of them, hardware, software, operating system, storage, network connectivity requirements. Uh, does this technology include the required data security functionality? I've worked in a number of organizations where they will bring in a series of technologies into their operational environment. And when they do this, it doesn't fit with what their security people are attempting to do. So the much of the project time is chewed up trying to get permission to gain access to it because the tools don't have their own inherent uh, data security and other things that they're, they're trying to put in place. Remember, we started this little subsection here out with the comment that a tool in the hands of a fool and again, this is what you see happen over and over and over again. So let's dive in and look a little bit more about what we're talking about from an architectural perspective. And, and our data technology is part of the overall technology architecture of the entire organization. Uh, I've seen this word abbreviated as architecture. Okay, that's maybe okay. Um, again, getting a little bit of play there, but not not a whole lot as far as a buzzword goes. But it's Really, again, with the uh, we'll look at profiling in just a bit. But when we look at profiling, we're saying how does profiling fit in with the rest of the organization's technology, and how does it complement the organization's existing data architecture that we have? Our questions, again, here that we really want to have answered are: what technologies are required, standard, preferred, or acceptable? What technologies apply to which purposes and which circumstances? And in a distribute environment, where do we get into data movement and how do these things contribute? And most environments are distributed today, so this becomes a very important piece. The architecture then allows us to talk specifically about what are the database management capabilities that we have in the organization. And, and you guys have to be a little careful, too. Remember, I'm a university professor, but I'm here to tell you that most universities and colleges are not teaching the students anything at all about these technologies. They're not teaching them anything other than how to build 
a new database. And that's a horrible system. We're trying to address it here at Damon International as we pull this thing forward. But at the same time, it is a big, big problem. There are also a series of database management utilities that you have. Uh, you know, load, unload, uh, different types of security pieces, all sorts of things uh, that help us with tuning and management of the organizational data technologies in general. There's data modeling and model management software. There's business intelligence software. All of these are diverse. It's unlikely that people who uh, understand and know how to use your BI software are going to be experienced with data modeling. It's equally unlikely that people with data modeling are going to be necessarily uh, uh, informed about ETL types of technologies. Uh, there's other classes too. We've got data quality analysis, data cleansing, and finally we get into this topic of metadata that's always a lot of fun. Uh, that's a different topic entirely, but we will dive into a couple of those. So one of the things you need is to have an idea of where you're going with this. And once the organization understands that if it's important for them to extend the scope of their metadata management practices, and they need some additional technology in order to do this, this is what allows you to create a roadmap that can give you a spend <coughs> that will allow uh, the organization to understand what it is you're trying to build. And when they say, well, why haven't you finished yet? You're able to say, well, you told me I was going to have this particular technology, uh, whatever that might be in there. So this leads us around to our first polling question that we have here. And uh, again, Shannon, I think you're going to jump in and do this one because uh, I can't actually do it from this end of here. So we want you guys to tell us, what do you think is the one thing to understand about technology? Uh, is it A, sometimes it's free? Is it B, that buying the same technology that everybody else is using and using it in the same way will create business value? Or is it C, it should always be regarded as a means to an end rather than an end in itself? So we'll give you a minute here on this to uh, give your uh, responses. Shannon, I'm hoping you see some things come up there. I do. It looks like right now the majority is answering C. We just have one All person right. answer B. And, we'll and actually the, we've got it closing here. Let me post the results for you. As soon as it's open, excuse the sniffles. So we're we're, we're experimenting with some new technology here. Though. This is working great, isn't it? <laughs> I teach me how to do it, and you can get out of the out of the picture with it. So there are the results for you. Okay, very good. Well, uh, again, most no, that's interesting. I guess most of you didn't answer. Tisk, uh, not most of you. Forty-five percent didn't participate. Tisk, tisk. Get you guys to <laughs> to do that. But anyway, those that did answer with C, correct. Absolutely, that is exactly what we want to do: is to regard it as a means to an end rather than the end in and of itself. And the reason for that is because technology, even if it's free, it's never really free. Uh, one of my favorite uh, folks that I work with at the University of Ghana, Joseph Pola, says, look, if it's free, that means you're the product. And I agree with him 100% there. Uh, you'll see a lot of things there that talk about open source technology and things, but it requires care and feeding. And if you don't do this, uh, it simply will not work. Uh, again, got to be regarded as the means to the end rather than the end in and of itself. Think about it from a modeling perspective. If you are modeling, you know, what's the purpose of the model? Every model represents an analysis product. So the purpose of doing a model is to solve some sort of business objective that we're trying to do. And the last point is, of course, crucial. If everybody's buying the same technology and everybody's using the technology over and over again, Believe it or not, I just stepped on a telephone there. <laughs> Everybody's using the same technology in the same way. You don't get a competitive advantage. You're really just keeping up with the Joneses there. So that's good. Good start on that for you guys and good answers on that. Let's dive into case technologies here. So case tools have a nice definition. Uh, again, I've got an example for it up in the corner up there where you guys can all see that. The, and we're going to dive into it a little bit more detail on that. But the idea is Again, we're putting in place something that allows us to manage the metadata on these things. Think about it. If you had to create a model and use modeling technologies each time and create it from scratch, it would drive you nuts. So people like Charlie Bachman in the old days put together a whole series of these technologies. And yet, in spite of this, and here I am at a data modeling conference with the Mark Gadero and CA and some of the other guys that are out there, on this, and guess what the biggest case tool is? Well, it's Microsoft, and it's a combination of Visio, PowerPoint, and Excel. 
Um, I would absolutely not recommend that you use those as your modeling environments, but that's what most people do, and that, of course, is the reason we have so many challenges in this particular environment. Uh, again, the ones I'd really rather have you focus on are the things like ERWIN or ER Studio, which is entity relationship modeling uh, for the ER in there. There is a list of case tools that a colleague up at uh, SUNY keeps track of for us. I put that link down at the bottom. It will give you an awful lot of good information that you have there. But more to the point, this is where you have to think about it. Now, we talk about the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, and it, it really does work in this environment. You're not just buying the seats. So here's a study that we did for an organization over uh, a long period of time, and they were looking at 75 seats at $2,500 a pop. They were looking at it uh, fairly straightforward as you know $187,000 to spend on this thing. Even that's a lot of money in today's environment, but nevertheless. If we don't have that ability to do at least that, then your knowledge workers, who are the people who are doing the development work that we're trying to get done in our organizations, are going to take longer, it's going to cost more, and they're going to produce less. What we really, of course, want to do is incorporate the total cost of that, which you can see now the next layer of the pyramid down, there's about 360000 almost double the site license. Uh, costs that are there, perhaps buying some new workstations. Uh, you may have a Windows XP environment and you need to have something more modern than that uh, in there. So there's another million dollars just to start up right there. And then finally we need some in-house support, ongoing hardware and software. So you can see this relatively small investment in $2,500 a seat that easily expands to a $2.5 million investment over five years. And just not be Let's be totally clear about this. If you're going to invest two and a half million dollars into computer-aided software engineering, and I'm very much a firm believer that we should, it's also incumbent on us to show how that two hundred, uh, excuse me, two and a half million dollar investment has saved us money over the long term. Because if we don't do that, then the organization eventually will say, "So what's the point?" I put together this diagram a little while ago showing that we can divide the case tool taxonomy, the case tool environment into uppercase, middle case, and lower case. There are management tools that help you do this. There are technical tools. There are support tools uh, that, that allow you to do this. Uh, again, a different uh, sort of perspective on this, mainly just to show you that it's a non-trivial environment, and you will need to spend some time looking at this and have some good conversations with the vendors. Of course, that's one of the things that's going on here in the hotel is that everybody's looking at these Things. Here's a, a, another component of all that, which is that these case tools generally now have integrated XML. Now, if you don't know what XML is, XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. It's one of the big new technological investments that we've made uh, in this environment in the last 10 years. It's a piece that allows us essentially to create metadata about whatever it is we're doing, whatever it is we're modeling. So here on this particular slide, the entity person now has an expanded definition there, and you can see the element DM list on the right-hand side and the attribute list where it's showing all the specific pieces of this. But this gives you an idea of also the types of things that the case tools do. We have the attributes that are there. Uh, we have the associations, what the person entity is related to. It's related to an applicant, to an employee, to a person address. It's part of certain model views that we have. It's linked in certain ways. We have actually the diagram in the bottom right-hand quadrant that you can see. And again, the upper right-hand quadrant is the XML component that goes into this. Now, we're at an interesting place in case tool technologies. The old model was that everything had to fit into one case tool. And that was a challenge for organizations because case tools, as we started out this session, do certain things very well and other things uh, not so well. Uh, so this gave you limited access outside of the case environment and the case tool supported specific methodologies, which meant you had limited additional metadata use that you could use there. Now what we're seeing is that case tools are looking more like they'd like to operate off of some existing uh, repository technology. So I've pulled the XML into this, the metadata that pulls it, and we have this integrated XML pile that we can 
operate a variety of case tools and technologies against this. Uh, I'll give you just a very brief example. One of the case tools was very good at drawing, and another one was very good at uh, doing analysis of business rules. Well, nothing wrong with either of those two things, but if you want to do both of them, you shouldn't have to choose between an either-or situation. You'd like to be able to gain access to it in both ways uh, in order to do it. So that's our brief overview of case tools. Let's move on into repositories now and talk a little bit about them. And I, I put this slide up, even though it's very old uh, at this point. Uh, it's still true. Most IS and managers and executives don't understand what it is because they see it as an esoteric technology that's not related to the business. Now, it's hugely related to the business, but we are the ones that have to make that particular case. And for some reason, we are seeing good things that are happening in the repository environment, but at the same time, it's not widely adopted as a technology. So most organizations don't use repository technologies at all. One in four are building their own entirely. And again, the traditional players that I was looking at have a minority of the market, which means there's a lot more coming into this environment, a lot more things that are happening in the environment than were happening in the past. Now, the traditional uh, process around repositories was that you had sort of passive analysis. You could say, well, if I need to expand, oh, let's just say the date field, for example, uh, you know, what is the extent of that implementation going to cost us? How big is it going to be? How complicated is that whole environment going to be? Um, I may have some sort of relational or data warehouse type things. I may include batch and reports. Um, they're optional, but they're not critical to have, and end up being pretty proprietary, if you will. Again, that's the old way. The new one is that we've got some new standards which protect your investment. In there, we've got some openness and some simplification of choices. XMI is XML, meta-based um, uh, interchange standards. Uh, we're including metadata management, not just passive analysis, including messaging, which means we're also starting to pull these tools into our data governance uh, processes now. It gives us the ability to, in real time, do ad hoc support for decisioning around various data decisions uh, that are there, and allows us to produce a daily business value within a production architecture. I have one group that I work with that is a, a fun group that we've been working together for a number of years. And when their metadata environment goes down, when their repository goes down, their production goes down. And when their production goes down, their repository goes down. They are highly linked, highly coupled, very, very tightly integrated. And that may not work at all for your business, but it works really well for these groups. Now, one of the other things you want to keep an eye out for, too, is this magic quadrant diagram. And every year, Gardner puts out a new version of the magic quadrant diagram uh, on here. So you know, don't look for the old ones. But it's also interesting to look over time and see how these things have changed. And the, the general approach to these things is largely similar. The one thing that's been different on this, if we jump ahead 10 years now to the, the one they'll be putting out next year, is that IBM is playing a fairly big role in there. And the reason for that is because they bought that unicorn technology that's down in the bottom left-hand corner of the quadrant and started to integrate it with some other things. So again, very, very many uh, options that are there. But the, the implementation cost on these things is non-trivial. So before I told you that if we were doing 75 people and we use those numbers from that triangle chart, this means that we've got a $2.5 million investment. Well, here's another million dollars in many cases uh, that would be uh, incurred to the organization. And it's a, a challenge. So again, we have to have some real business value. And it's up to us as data management professionals to help the business realize what this is as we pull it together. Now, I'm going to show you this next chart, and this one may blow your minds a little bit. This is IBM's application development cycle information model. And the neat thing about it is it's actually done. So they have pulled this together uh, on their own many, many years ago. There's an IBM research article that describes this, and you can actually get the DDL from it uh, in order to look at this. And look at what they've integrated from a repository perspective, business rules, business model goals, process models, uh, things that are technical, DB2, for example, or IMS, as well as uh, flows, enterprise structures, lots and lots of things. And of course, many things are connected to many other things. 
uh, again, with this kind of an integrated model that you have here, this is sort of nirvana for repository people. Uh, it's not that we necessarily want to do all of this, but it's nice to know that it can be done. And most importantly for you all, don't start this process on your own. There's lots of this information that is out there that you can gain access to very, very easily and start to work with. So we do not need to start from ground zero in this case. We can start really from a much higher perspective. A couple of quick takeaways on <laughs> repositories. <coughs> Excuse me. The repository does not have to be an integrated solution. It must be an easily integratable solution. Repository functionality does not equal a repository. The metadata, however, must evolve towards a repository solution. It's not necessarily bad to have multiple repositories as interim solutions. It's not bad or wrong to use Excel to manage your metadata. But what you want to do is as you're doing this, you want to architect it so that you have First of all, a generic minimal functionality, create, read, update, and delete, and evolve these metadata items over time. If you don't have that, then you have a lot of people working on not data but metadata, and that's even more esoteric than just the data management stuff uh, in some cases. So if you're going to manage metadata robustly, you need metadata repository functionality. Uh, they would love to sell you some metadata repositories along the way. I'd rather you play with it for a little bit and then come along and say, okay, now that I've got this experience managing metadata, I can now have a good conversation with the vendors. But unfortunately, these things end up as what we call shelfware in many cases, and we want to be very careful and not end up with that type of thing as well. Next one, profiling and discovery tools. These are great. This is also a wonderful, wonderful set of technologies. I have to toot my own horn a little bit. The group I was with at the Defense Department early on funded the research that allowed us to put this in place. So what we were doing was looking at the DOD environment, which as you can imagine is pretty big, and trying to figure out how we were going to do some of the things we needed to do. And we said we need a game changer. We need something that will give us an order of magnitude improvement. And these technologies deliver that 10x productivity over the manual approaches. The two parts to this. One, we can get data to be scanned in a lot of different places. And scanning it does a really good thing because we can then look at factual information. What is it we're looking at? in terms of this data. By the way, this all goes to play into that reverse engineering we were talking about as well. The scanning process gives us a tremendous amount of information, but what this tells us is not necessarily factual information about the data. It tells us factual information about the data and values that are there. We then have to go back to the SMEs, the subject matter experts, who can tell us about this. Now, in the old days, the way we used to do it was that we would walk into a room and we had sort of this manual brute force repository dependent quality and different not repeatable process that involves setting up a Beamer and talking to people and saying, tell us a bit about your business. Well, that's interesting and productive, and many of you have done that, and it works out really, really well. But the new way is semi-automated. It's engineering. It's repository independent. We can integrate quality in at the same time. It's repeatable, which means you can practice it and get good at it. And it allows us now to be current and accurate in a way that we have not been able to do so before. These technologies allow us to do things like, and here's an example from one of the uh, data sets. If we look at the circle on underneath attribute that says pay code, and we look across the top there, you can see it has an inferred minimum value of asterisk. If you proceed across that same line, line five, it has an inferred maximum value of V as in Victor. There are only eight distinct records out of 5,108 that we looked at. So we might say to ourselves, what does an asterisk in pay code mean? In the past, we would have had to gain access to these subject matter experts. We would bring them into a room. We'd have them there for a couple of days, and we'd be asking them these kinds of questions. What we are able to do with these tools now is we're able to form our own hypothesis. And our own hypothesis might include the following thinking. If I look and see that there's an asterisk in pay code for the minimum value, and I double click on those, and I can get this thing in the bottom right-hand corner, see where it says value frequencies, 
the asterisk there, it's a little covered up by that that, that error, <clears throat> occur at 11.4918% of the sample. And somebody may say, you know, it occurs to me that 11% of our pay uh, force is in the UK, so maybe that means let's process that payroll with the UK. And we double click again and we can see the drill down where it says source orders there. And you can see that every one of the payment methods in that drill down, the pay code is asterisk and the pay method is UK. So an asterisk in the pay code means that we have now the UK payment that occurs in there. Then I have that now as a hypothesis. I call somebody over in the payroll technical department and say, um, is it true that when pay code, is, pay code is an asterisk, we pay them out of the UK? And they say, yes. Now we have transformed that into a valid piece of information that allows us to um, operationalize this much more quickly than we would have in the traditional fashion. These data discovery and analysis tools, profiling, whatever it is you're going to call it, uh, the market is kind of divided out there on, on how they should be referred to, are a tremendous asset for organizations. And most importantly, the vast majority of the organizations that are working with these tools will allow you to rent them. So you don't need to buy them outright. You can try them in your environment and allow them to tell you how valuable they are. And when they show you how valuable you are, then you can, again, have a nice conversation with your management as well as with the vendors that are on that. Okay, let's go into some data quality engineering tools here. And then we've got sort of four, four, four classes of tools that are here. We've already talked about data profiling uh, that's in here, but the categories are analysis, cleansing, enhancement, and monitoring. Uh, sometimes it's just important to keep errors from coming in. Sometimes it's important to be able to quickly and efficiently <clears throat> increase the effective of the data there. Sometimes we need to do cleansing or just transformation. Sometimes we just want to know what's going on. So as we look over these types of things, we can also see that the principal technologies include that profiling. We also include parsing and standardization. Some of you may have seen this on websites when you're trying to order something from a, an online retailer and they standardize your addresses. The reason they do that is because they want to know which UPS or FedEx truck they're going to put this thing on. Uh, the third category there is data transformation. Fourth one is identity resolution and matching. And by the way, that fourth one is going to become very important as you start working more and more with the various cloud-based systems that we have out there. Uh, fifth one is enhancement, and the uh, excuse me, sixth one is reporting in there. So again, I'm not going to read you these things here, but we've already talked a little bit about it. The profiling here allows you to do statistical analysis and assessment. But let me put it in a, word, in a way that you data folks will probably really understand well. With data profiling tools, you can take any data set and create a third normal form of what the internal logical representation of that model looks like, uh, the way the test was. So if you have a package or just some software that you don't understand, these tools can be used to produce a logical third normal form of that existing set. And if you understand that, that means you can make your decisions in a facts-based way instead of in a guessing-based way. And that's just one of the many uses for data quality tools in that area. Parsing and standardization, we also call this now fancy names like text mining and analytics. Okay? But it's still the same thing. We're looking for patterns that we feed into rules engines to help us understand what's actually going on in these areas. So very, very sophisticated stuff. You'll see these around. There's some very, very good partners that we work with that are a lot of fun to do. Uh, all these data transformation. These are the idea that when an X comes in, we always want it to be a Y on the other end of it, Again, whatever that happens to be. So these tools allow you to have certain inputs. You can pre-program them. If you look at these data transformation tools, they primary use in today's environment, even though the quality approach is very, very good, the primary approach today is that we're actually replacing legacy systems with them. Because if you look at the most basic level of abstraction for many, many of these tools, they start out and they say, we put in this stuff, and it comes out this way. Well, if that's the case, then you don't need to do that with application code. You can do that with a tool and just maintain the rule set instead of the code. Very, very big benefits in these areas as well. I already mentioned identity matching and, and 
and resolution type things, again, if you've ever applied for credit online or anything, it goes through the same type of thing. Are you the person who lived at these areas? Uh, again, it gives you statistics, uh, uh, probabilistic inference and things like that that can be improved. And that's the nice part about it. Once it starts to understand what you're doing, these things actually get better. It's uh, not quite artificial intelligence, but it's certainly moving towards that area in general. Uh, enhancement tools. Uh, again, this is the idea that if I've got a latitude and longitude piece, it might be actually useful to pull up a map at some function and show them what the actual map is or a 3D flyover of that particular piece. Uh, so again, you can see date and time stamps, auditing information, geographic, uh, all kinds of things that go into this enhancement file. And finally, reporting, just good old reporting. In most cases, people forget how good our SQL people are. Uh, but a couple of, of good SQL programmers can do an awful lot of measuring and metricizing, if you will. don't really like that word, but you get the idea. Just, hey, oh, by the way, one, one of the, my favorite pieces to do for organizations is a lot of them will say, well, we're becoming more customer-centric. We're going to learn more about our customers. And the birth date of the customer becomes an important piece of that. Well, a good SQL programmer can sit down and write you out what is the distribution across a 30-day month of the birthdays, and if they all occur on the first of the first of the month, you know that you haven't probably got either a very good data sample or your data quality may be lacking in that area. And before you roll out the entire process and say, "Hey, we're a good customer-centric organization," uh, it might be a good idea just to make sure that we actually have our ducks in a row, if you will. So these are our, our, our quality engineering tools. Let's now talk about the data lifecycle because the real key for this is knowing which tools to apply at which stage of the life cycle. And again, our process in here has been that we really haven't well understood what data life cycles are. We've only been working with this area for a bit. This is an old version of the life cycle. This is the one we prefer to use. And for various reasons, we ended up putting it in a circle here. So I'll just skip over to those pieces, and you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, we start off with new systems development. The bottom right-hand corner we use for existing systems, and this will take you around, and notice that the center part of it is metadata and data storage that we have. So this allows us to really understand at a much deeper level what's happening and apply formal methods. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to use different tools for different phases of the life cycle. So something else that you can use to help guide you into your selection process is looking at this relative to the life cycle and figuring out which tools are relatively speaking in each particular area. All right. Other technologies, and there's some neat ones that will go in here as well. Let's just talk about what data, data integration is. It's the idea of pulling together and reconciling disparate data that organizations have all over the place. Well, that's nice, but you know, what do we need in order to do this? Because data integration is typically what everybody is looking to achieve. And as we do that, <clears throat> you can now start to see that this includes servers, something called enterprise information integration technologies, portals, and conversion tools. Oops, I don't went one slide too far, which leads us to our second polling question there, Sharon. And so we want to ask the question of you guys, which is not a strategic technology trend in 2013? The hybrid IT cloud computing or the app and cloud com? Uh, and the last one is a personal cloud, sorry, cloud computing or the personal cloud com. So which one do you guys think has not been seen as the, by the gardeners and things as a strategic trend for next year? All right, so two of the three are, but one of them is not. Hopefully, Shannon, we're getting some responses there. We are. Uh, it looks like B and C are becoming just about even. A few people are saying mm. A. You gave them more time to answer this one, too. I did. I didn't think it was... We don't yeah. want to cut anybody off. All right, let's see what you guys thought. It's closing down here, and I will share the results in just four seconds. It says. Mainly because I can't see them either, so I'm curious as well. <laughs> yeah, so those of you that don't know, Shannon's on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. Okay, yeah, so it looks like. Yeah. B was the big one. 
And so we had more of you participate this time. We appreciate that. And the answer actually is B. B is the one that has not been considered. So personal cloud and hybrid IT and cloud computing are actually seen as strategic trends for the next year. So thank you, Shannon. That's interesting. Uh, let me get that in there. And I need you to pull that off so I can move. There we go. Next piece. So what we're starting to see here is mobile devices are, are starting to become very, very common. And they now want to make sure that your mobile devices can get access to everything that you can get on your desktop. Um, believe me, I don't want everything on my mobile device that's on my desktop, but nevertheless, it's becoming important from a business perspective. And when we say mobile phones, we're also including tablets and pads and things like that in there as well. Um, again, personal clouds, enterprise app stores. The Internet of Things is a very interesting uh, component, which is that eventually consumer devices will plug directly into the cloud. You're already seeing this with Nike and some other companies that are doing uh, physical types of things around that. Uh, and very, very interesting work that's going on there. And, and again, big data is becoming more important as well. Um, In-memory computing is also very, very big because flash memory this year is now starting to drop below the price of regular memory, which means we're going to see more capabilities, and the price will continue to drop in those areas as well. Let's take a look at three specific types of technologies here as we round our way to the top of the hour. The first one, they're all three related to XML at this point, and, and the XML component is not critical. But what you're seeing here is an integration server. So you can even take off the XML portion of the diagram here. What we're looking at is sort of message-oriented middleware or an EAI-type adapter. Um, what this does is allows us to come in and put in a server where we have a bunch of things surrounding it, and we want the server to handle the various uh, uh, connections that go on there. Now that's different from a mediation server because mediation servers actually have answers in them. So they're trying to figure out correct or incorrect as they look at this. Uh, it can validate schemas or, or DTD. As we're looking at it, it can help us define business rules, look at GUIs that can make it very, very easy for everybody to do. And finally, we have a repository server that we can put in place. And again, this is storing information in there that people would like to gain access to. Uh, if you're building service environments, then these repositories become very useful because they provide the metadata that everybody needs to get into and out of these various requirements. That's just one idea of the nuances that go into there in terms of the servers. Here's another one, too. This has been around for actually about 15 years, but portals are now becoming very, very good integration technologies, and, and we call them data management technologies. The idea is that on the left-hand side of this diagram, those are a bunch of old apps that we used to have. We used to have a separate sign-on. We used to have separate security around them. We used to have to build the same GUI. And if we take those apps and bring them all together under a portal, which is the thing I'm showing you on the right there, we have a simplified user interface to get access to these things. And if we do one more thing, which is to make sure that the data in the background shares the same common data model, then we can start to do some very cool things. And I'll, I'll just exemplify this from an example from SAP. SAP at one point in time had the ability to take anything in your SAP environment and wrap it up in XML. So even though this is sort of an interesting looking diagram, if you've never seen an SAP screen, that's the one on the right there. But if you look down under master data, and you'll see that there's an arrow that somebody has dragged over there. What they really did is they were looking at SAP there, and they grabbed this thing called sold to party 36981. Nobody knows really what 36981 is beyond the label York Enterprises, Hopewell Avenue, Philadelphia, 19113. But if I grab it there and drag it over to my master data in customer on there, <clears throat> it will actually launch the MDM solution and come up with a bunch more information about York Enterprises, such as the last time the salesperson visited, how much they bought from us in the past, da 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 so you could take these various applications, wrap them up in XML, and put them in portals, and they become tremendously, tremendously productive environments. Another way to use portals is as a data quality tool. Uh, the data in the tool, in the portal, should be of known quality, whereas the data outside the tool, portal 
might be of unknown quality. Well, that's a little bit problematic, and, and I hope that most of you all don't have to say the following statement. All of the data in our organization is of unknown quality. That's a very scary thing to say. But if it is, then you need to start doing something we call data branding, which is to start pulling data into some other places in your environment and making sure that these this data is of known quality. It doesn't have to be of perfect quality, but at least it's of known quality in there. Uh, two more tools here as we get close to the top of the hour. One is a data virtualization tool, and this is kind of an interesting one. The data objects that I'm showing you in teal here are physical objects in physical databases. So I can take a database starting on the right-hand side of the screen here, and you'll see it's a little tough to read on your screens, but the top one is called contact and the bottom one is called customer. And I merge the two of them together to produce the orange piece underneath that that's a combination of the two. But that table only exists in memory. Then I can take that and incorporate that with charts to give me something a little bit more about customers and then take the other three pieces in the sort of mid upper left quadrant there and pull it together. So everything in orange on this particular chart is created virtually, which means also that the knowledge workers in your environment can do this type of exploratory analysis and see what kinds of data integration components they can pull together with just about virtually no interaction beyond setting this thing up for the environment that they're working in. Business users love this. Because as we know, as we're working with our business users and BI, the one thing they do know is that they can't specify in advance, but they know it when they see it. Well, this allows them to get in, play with these tools and technologies, pulling them together without creating large amounts more of legacy stuff in our environment. Our final tool we're going to look at today, then, is a transformation tool that we talked about a little bit. This gets us a little bit into some unstructured data too, although uh, really if we were turning unstructured data into structured data, the definition of something being unstructured is that it has no structure, so we couldn't structure it. So I like to think of things really as more semi-structured uh, rather than unstructured, but you'll, you'll encounter this as well. And the idea here is that we can take these documents that come in, RTF, HTML, HL7, right, tabs, EDI, all sorts of things like that, and they can be turned into text that turns them into Microsoft Words or other transactional environments or XML documents uh, in, in the way of doing this. And these are developed for the series of GUIs, so we can just grab and drag these things back and forth, around and around. And again, the users are more or less in control, obviously within certain restrictions. And this allows them then to see what it is they are looking for. Now, here's just a list of data management tools here uh, that we've pulled together for you. Again, these are from the Data Management Body of Knowledge, the thing we want you guys to study and become CMPs. And again, any of you that have gone through this series this year and have sat for your CMP and found this helpful, I would love for you to drop us a note because we'd like to, to find out how we can better help the community in this area. And if we've got some success stories, it would be great, but it would also be good to know what we could do better uh, in the whole process. So again, you can see governance, architecture, development, uh, operations management security reference data goes on and on for a couple of pages there that allows us to look specifically at tools that are useful in there. So if you're thinking about a tool, look at where it can apply. The idea here is that we could take this backwards and say, well, if I'm going to buy a repository, what does it help? And we can look at those things all the way around. Well, we've reached the top of the hour here again, and our outline is pretty straightforward. Uh, again, gave you a little bit of an overview of data management, talked about the tools overview. And I hope that if nothing else you've gotten out of this uh, one-hour session of being with us, the data management technology environment is rich, it's complicated, there's neat things that are happening in there, and we are able to show substantive business values in a large way very, very quickly. So as we do this, uh, we will move into the Q&A portion of this, and I will turn it over to uh, Megan and see what she's got in the questions for you guys. All right. Thanks, Peter. That was a great presentation. And now it's time for a Q&A. Um, time for you all to ask your questions, so just click on the Q&A chat feature. You should be able to submit your questions through that chat window. So we'll see what comes through. We've had a couple come through already. Let's see here. 
go ahead and get started with the first one. Um, first question is, is the Microsoft Master Data Management product an example of a metadata repository? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, it can be used that way. So Microsoft, like many of the other vendors, has, has uh, if you will, gotten data management religion recently. And so their tool set is, is being reflective. And, and basically what you see is that you can use many of these tools in multiple different ways. Uh, if we have something that we can stick something into in a, in a repository type function, then absolutely it can be used that way. Um, I've also seen people do the same thing with SharePoint. Um, by the way, I've seen people do things with SharePoint that will just make you cringe. So it's a sort of a good and bad situation there in terms of uh, uh, how to do all that. But yes, the uh, short answer is yes, it absolutely can work that way. It may be not necessarily what you want, but it's a good place to start practicing. And most importantly, if you architect your data correctly in that area, what that means is that when and if you decide to move into a more robust technology, the transformation is a very simple one, and you're up and running and able to deliver business value much more quickly than you would if you hadn't been thinking long term in terms of your architecture. Thanks for the question. It's a great one. Okay, great. And the next question is, with all that is going on in case technology, should we avoid it until it settles down? I don't think so. Uh, really, the, I guess I didn't even say this, but my, my overarching philosophy about tools is that most tools can help, and it's generally better with a tool than without a tool. So while we are seeing some, some dust-ups in the case space and things like that, uh, the basic products are inherently helpful. And so I would absolutely urge you guys to, to definitely play with it. By the way, you know, when you go out and buy these tools, and, and my, my colleagues in the tool community kind of hate it when I say this, but uh, oftentimes the tools will actually be out there. So for example, I had to buy um, a, a, a doctoral student that we're working with here, a package called EndNote, which is sort of a case tool for managing your, your references for your um, uh, dissertation and things like that. And she really didn't need the latest version, which cost a couple hundred dollars. And like most of us around today, the university environments are scrambling for money, and you know, if we can avoid paying it, we can. So instead of buying her version 6 of the tool, which is the current one that's out there and costs $200, I found an old shrink-wrapped copy of the tool out there that somebody had on the shelf uh, for $25. Uh, now, you can do the same thing with these case tools. So while you might get the newest version of Erwin, and the newest version has some really neat features in it, you might not need that for your project. So you can find a vendor that bought a couple copies of it early on, look around on eBay or Amazon, or, or just search for, through the software things on the web, and you'll find these things are, are really down to the price of a lunch in some cases just to get you started. So absolutely, get something there and start. Don't wait. I don't know that it's ever going to settle down. <laughs> All right, and the next question is, can you recommend one specific case tool? Well, the short answer is no. I mean, I don't know what you're trying to do. So the key, again, is to find out what you're attempting to do with the case tool and help to match it up that way. Absent those business requirements, any answer I gave you would be just the same as going to your physician and saying, I don't feel very good. Can you give me something to make you feel better? Well, your doctor might hand you a beer and that may not be the best thing for you. So uh, no, uh, definitely want to put a little bit more thought into that and, and dive in. Again, we're happy to help you out in terms of figuring out what could be useful in your environment. All right, we just had one come in. Um, vendors don't make so many differences between tools. Most of the time they provide data quality, ETL, migration, and MDM which are often integrated. Do you think such integrated tools are less performing? Let me offer you guys a, a um, unfortunately the consultant's answer is that it depends. So if you have an integrated system that does things, let me, let me run it back to the old days that, that some of us still remember, which is that you had a, a hi-fi system that had components. You might have a record player and a tuner and some speakers and an amplifier and a cassette deck. And all of these pieces worked together and worked well, 
but it was more expensive. And then somebody came along with this concept called a boom box. And the boom box, oh, man, boom box. Oh, that's pre-iPod days, obviously, for, for most of you. But the boom box had all that functionality built in it, but it didn't do any of them very well. It had a radio, but it was a scratchy radio. It had a cassette player in it, but it was not a high fidelity one. It had speakers in it, but it didn't really help out from that perspective either because the speakers didn't really show what we were attempting to to, to push out the, the things. Again, you can only do so much with a three-inch speaker that you can with a 15-inch speaker. Um, and I say that as a bass player, right? So, so the idea here is that while in some cases your organization might benefit from an integrated tool that does a number of things all at once, kind of like the switchblade and the Swiss knife you know, kind of uh, scenario, um, you probably don't want to build a, a cabinet with a Swiss Army knife. But for certain uses, the Swiss Army knife is a very appropriate thing to have. Uh, again, it depends if your needs are such that the vast majority of the organizational requirements are met by this integrated tool and it provides you the throughput that you need and you can get people to use it without having to send out a state for them or out of country for them uh, in some cases, then that's great. Um, but you're not going to know. That's really the key. You've got to get in and find out a lot more about your needs organizationally and then what the tools provide in that area. And I, I do want to give you one other resource that we have in here as well, which is that uh, there's a group called the Bloor Group, B-L-O-O-R. If you just Google them, they come right up to the top. They provide a lot of very, very in-depth analyses of the data management tool space. And their reports are very, very good, and I have found them to be an extremely good source and an extremely reasonable. Uh, again, we'll go back to the example we talked about earlier. If you're thinking about investing a million dollars in case tools, it's worth probably a thousand or so for you to go in and get an objective report that tells you the pros and cons of each one. I just think of it as a little bit of insurance. So not a plug per se with the Bloor groups. All the advisory services do them, but I've used Bloor and had very good results with them. I like them a lot. All right, and it looks like that is all the questions we have for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in today's event. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks again to Dataversity and Shannon for hosting us. Once again, you will receive today's materials within the next two business days. Next month, we will be focusing on the business value of data and ROI. Hopefully, you guys will be able to join us for that as well. And as always, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everyone, for attending, and have a great day.